Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Yeah, babies, how the hell y'all doing out there? This is Grimnir and this is the Grim Leftovers Program. It's Monday night, March 2nd, 2020. Yeah, this is episode 61 of the Grim Leftovers show, which is the ninth, the ninth episode of 2020. So uh, we're right. I hope you're ready for a good show. Uh, I'm ready to give you one. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be a good one. Uh, it's stuff that I, fi- I I always find it interesting when I'm going through all of my uh, reading list stuff that I saved there. Uh, <laughs> so 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 that I and I can uh, share it with you on the show and seeing how interesting some of the stuff is a lot of it you know it's if it's stuff that we've talked about a lot in the chat or wherever I don't uh, uh I I just delete those links but if there's something that I think I, I got some way to expand on I'll cover it here I'll bring it up here oh I see freedom's network is this site can't be reached huh okay uh, well, I guess that's why it wasn't updating for me. <laughs> oh, what do I got to tell you about anything? Um, well, uh, the uh, the uh, donation drive month is over, and thanks to everybody, everybody who contributed in any way they contributed and continue to contribute throughout the year and the many years that we've been here. Uh, the donation drive was a success. We, we got what we needed to stay up and alive uh, throughout this year of 2020 and on into next year. So uh, thank you all for everything, uh, the money, the thoughts, the uh, content provided, the show hosting, all, all the stuff that you guys do. The chat here in the chat room, man, because uh, that's a big part of the whole thing, of the overall experience of Real Liberty Media. So uh, I, I definitely appreciate all of that, um, and and so it was a good year. 2019 was a good year for RLM, and 2020 is bound to be another good one. Uh, we got uh, maybe a, maybe a new show coming up uh, on a monthly basis uh, with Flash and and Rob Works and uh, Larry Woods. So that, that'll be interesting to get that out. He they did one on yesterday. Uh, so, so that was interesting, uh, you know, talking about that uh, zero point energy stuff or free energy, if you if you like to call it that, whatever. So, uh, so that that'll be interesting. That'll be cool. Um, what other RLM news do I have for you? I don't really think I have any else, anything else. Everything else, everything's running pretty smooth. Uh, we got two more shows left with Lonnie Clark uh, this Wednesday and the following Wednesday which will be the the 11th of March, the anniversary of Fukushima earthquake there uh, and the subsequent nastiness that has occurred since then. So, uh, yeah, let me uh, make sure everybody knows that I'm on here because sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. <laughs> All right, let's get right on into it here. I got a bunch of stories, and we're, we're going to start off with the uh, uh, Char- Charles Charles Hugh Smith uh, on on his website of two minds dot com. This is posted almost a month ago on uh, February sixth, and it's called "Pandemic Lies and Videos." Yep, we will wonder what were we thinking, and marvel anew at the madness of the crowds. When we look back on this moment from the vantage of history, what will we think? Will, will we think how obvious it was that the coronavirus deaths in China were, the, were in the tens of thousands rather than the hundreds claimed by authorities? Will we think how obvious it was that the virus would spread around the globe, wreaking havoc on the global economy and social order, even as authority claimed only a handful of cases had arisen outside of China. Will we be amazed that the delusional confidence that the United States economy would be untouched by the virus as stock markets quickly soared to new all-time highs 
while the world's largest economy ground to a halt in a desperate attempt to close the barn door after the horses had already escaped? Will we look back at the patently false data being promoted by authorities and wonder why the majority accepted it as credible? Will we re-examine all the smartphone videos posted on the web by average people and wonder why all of the lies were given more credibility than actual videos? Will we, will we recall how, can, uh, how content that the parrot did, uh, that didn't... Uh, what, Will we recall how content that didn't parrot the approved narrative that everything was under control and the global impact would be near zero was suppressed, banned, deplatformed, or marginalized? Will we wonder at the complacency of all those who accepted this orchestrated suppression with obedient passivity? Will we look back at the claim that only 12 people in the entire United States United States had the virus, despite all the direct flights from Wuhan and tens of thousands of people who traveled from China to the United States in January and marvel at our credulity? Will we look back at the wreckage left in the wake of the coordinated campaign to suppress the facts and lay the responsibility for all of the carnage on the authorities who devoted more energy to hiding the realities of the pandemic then to preparing us for the impact? Will we ponder incre the incredible grip of mass delusion on the human mind when, we're, when we recall the confidence that the United States economy was invulnerable to the virus and that the implosion of China and the blithe quasi-religious faith that the central banks would never let global stock markets decline even 2%? Will we wonder how the mainstream could watch the Chinese economy shutting down and still remain absolutely confident that the global economy would be untouched as a spot of bother was sure to evaporate in a week or two and all would be restored to pre-virus euphoria? Will we wonder what we were thinking and marvel anew at the madness of the crowds? Will we wonder... Why we embrace the delusion so readily and relive the moment when the gate to reality cracked open? Will we, will we relive our realization that we'd embrace the absurd fantasy floating on a tissue of lies? Or will we bury that painful moment of truth? <laughs> now, you see, like I said, this is uh, from February 6th. And a lot of what he is forecasted, I guess that's the proper terminology, a lot of what he has forecasted as uh, from looking back from a vantage point in the future is already here, and it's not even a month later yet, because a, lo a lot of these things have either come to pass or started to come to pass, uh, because uh, the <laughs> last week, the uh, Stock markets took the huge dive, huge dive. Although today they recovered nicely. They were up like, what, 1,300 points today, even though that's a portion of the 4,000 to 5,000 points they dropped last week. So <laughs> Charles, looking ahead in time, uh, maybe not realizing how compressed that, that was going to be, uh, as things move forward, but uh, I always I always like his posts. He uh, he gets right to the point. He doesn't really pull any punches on any things. Uh, so check out his website there of two minds dot com and uh, the rest of the stuff. He puts up some really good stuff uh, there uh, on on that on that site, and he posts it around. It gets over there to Zero Hedge and other places. Uh, so uh, thanks, Charles, for that. Appreciate it. All right, now we go over uh, to a different, a different thing, a whole different thing. Yeah, uh, brick bat making work, make work measure, make work measure. This is on Reason, posted on February third. <laughs> uh, 
Oregon's Supreme Court has approved a ballot referendum that would ban stores from having more than two self-check kiosks, self-checkout kiosks. The measure is backed by unions, of course, including the Oregon AFL-CIO, who says it will save jobs. They say the kiosks also make it easier for minors to buy alcohol. Really, does it? Uh, but the Northwest Grocery Association says the machines let shoppers check out more quickly and with greater privacy. I would agree with that. So that's all there is to the article. That's the whole thing right there. They're just telling you the Oregon Supreme Court has approved this ballot referendum because they want to drive businesses out of business, or at least out of Oregon, because those businesses are going to say, why are we paying these clowns 10, 15 bucks an hour to check people to sit there and ring stuff up at a, at a, at a cash register when they can do it themselves and have a better time and not have to deal with the morons that are there at the, up at the uh, check stand, and also the baggers. And it's interesting, though, they all the uh, the bags they have here are cloth bags, uh, and they're ninety nine cents a piece at at the self checkouts. So um, wh whatever that's worth. <laughs> so uh, the 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 businesses, the various businesses, well, whatever it is, whether it's a grocery store or a department store that. Uh, uh, does not does not want to allow self checkouts or uh, uh, burger flippers demanding fifteen dollars an hour. They're, they're all screwing themselves. They are screwing themselves big time. They don't realize that they are just arguing for a way for them to be put out of a job completely. And then what will they do? I mean, it's not like they have skills, or they wouldn't be working at a goddamn grocery store checking people out at, at a bag line. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. <laughs> Speaking of government idiocy, it's not, it's not solely a United States thing. It pretty much goes everywhere around the world. And, and we have a story right here about that right now. This article, also posted on the 3rd of February, 2020, from Breitbart.com, Trudeau Minister proposes forcing, forcing new websites to have a government license. <sighs> Canadian Heritage, Heritage Minister Stephen Gubbe, some French name, uh, has stated that news websites, along with social media companies, could be forced to obtain licenses to operate in Canada. Again, they'll leave. They will just leave. They don't want your government licenses. They don't want your government fingers in their business. So the World Wide Web is a worldwide. They can go somewhere else. They can host their sites somewhere else. They don't need to do business in Canada. <laughs> the minister who has been tasked with updating Canada's broadcasting laws using the Canadian Radio, Television, and Te Telecommunications Commission, the CRTC, stated that Internet news sites will be, quote, asked, unquote, to obtain a government-approved license, broadcaster CTV reports. The report titled, uh, Canada's Co Communications Future, Time to Act. Now, they're, they're, this is a, a broadcast regulatory body, and they're going after websites, which is not broadcast. Anyway, so th that report was released on January 29th and included 97 recommendations. Uh, it details how the CRTC would be vastly expanded... Uh, yeah, a little empire building going on there, to not only regulate radio and television broadcasters, but news websites as well. 
If you're a distributor of content in Canada, and obviously if you're a very small media organization, the requirement probably wouldn't be the same if you're Facebook or Google. There would be, have to be some proportionality, proportionality embedded into this, he said during the CTV interview. When asked directly how the legislation would affect foreign websites, with a Breitbart, Breitbart News specifically named, Gubu said he did not think foreign sites would be blocked in Canada if they did not comply with the CRTC, at least not for now. Frankly, I'm not sure. I see what the big deal is, Gubo said. Of course not. You're the one pushing for it. It's no big deal to you. He added that other foreign companies in other industries actively comply with Canadian regulations. We recommend that the existing licensing regime in Broadcasting Act be accompanied by a registration regime. This would require persons carrying on a media... Uh, carrying on a media content undertaking by means of the Internet to register unless otherwise exempt. Recommendation 56 of the report states, Current CRTC regulations, including forcing commercial radio broadcasters who primarily play music to have at least 35% of their content per week come from Canadian artists. I don't know how easy that is. I mean, there are some Canadian artists that I enjoy. Obviously, Rush, and uh, you want to go back to, to uh, uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Uh, there, there's a few Canadian bands that I've liked over the years, but uh, 35%? I think you're nuts. Michael Geis, the Canadian Research Chairman in Internet and E-Commerce Law at the University of Ottawa, labeled the report candidly extreme and added it has no physical boundaries. Conservative MP Michelle Rempel-Garter, who also expressed concern over the proposals in the report, saying it's very paternalizing and also very frightening to think that the government would try to impose or say that's the role of the government to control. That puts us in league with countries that control the media. You mean like the United States? <laughs> Similar moves toward limiting free speech online have been made in Europe in recent months as well, with an October ruling by the Court of Justice of the European Union allowing governments to force social media giant Facebook to remove content. Which, if you could have just asked them, they would have removed it on their own because they love censorship over there at the Facebook. That, that is their middle name. Face... What, what am I talking about here? Oh, a closet salon de Antran. Yeah, not really so much. <laughs> you know, the woman, she really, she does nothing for me. I... I, I I don't even know why anybody listens to her. She does, I don't enjoy her voice. I, I don't like any of her songs that she chooses to choose. Uh, she does not look good to me. Uh, she just seems like a rotten person. Uh, so I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get the uh, why she became such a thing um, that she did. But uh, my God. Um. <laughs> Yeah, freedom of the nothing is what it is. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All right, we're, we're, this one is actually from uh, November 20th, 2019. I don't know how it got into that part of my list where it was, which was around a month ago or so, but uh, but it did. Um, and I, and, and I, I bring this back up because, well, I always love talking about this topic, the insanity of this topic. Uh, whenever I see it. Um, anyway, this is on dailymail.co.uk, posted on the 20th of November 2019. Here. Qantas, that's the uh, Australian airline, Qantas. Qantas boss blames increasing flight delays on... Drumroll, please. <laughs> Climate change. Climate change! 
<laughs> As he admits, the airline's ability to meet its schedule has been on the slide for years, meaning they're not really very good at what they do. <laughs> Climate change is causing a rising number of flight delays and cancellations. Sydney's on-time performance affected by higher wind strengths recently. Qantas executives say on-time performance has been on the slide for all carriers. It's not just us. Don't blame us. It's climate change. Yes, climate change is being blamed by the Qantas executives for the rising number of flight delays and cancellations at the Sydney airport. Above average wind strengths in recent months have contributed to a slight decline in flights departing or arriving on time, according to a new federal government aviation data report. Just over three quarters, 76.2 percent of flights across all airlines landed on time in September, compared to the long term average of 82 percent. So that's a good 6% drop right there. On-time departures were slightly hot or slightly were slightly highly who wrote this? Were slightly higher at a 78.4% compared to the long-term average of 83.7%. The data also revealed Qantas canceled 3.3% of flights well above the 2.2% average. On-time performance have been on the slide for all carriers year on year for the past three years, according to according to Qantas domestic chief. Uh, he blamed climate change as the main factor. Yes, climate change. <laughs> oh my God! We've seen wind velocities thirty four percent higher than average uh, of the last thirty years. And it's a prevailing westerly rather than southwest, south, southwesterly, as we've seen in the past. Yeah, so you always want the wind to be the same and from the same direction, or else it's climate change. That's led to runway closures, meaning aircraft movements, movements are slowed. Issues faced in Sydney and Melbourne during peak hours also affected on-time performance, Mr. David said. Mr. David? Hey, I know Mr. David. He, ha he goes by a different name. International and Regulatory Affairs Executive Andrew Parker added Qantas is treating climate change as if it were real. I mean, very seriously. And described it as an urgent challenge. Or at least a convenient scapegoat. Oh yeah, we cut costs right, left, and center. That that's not the reason. We have significant plans to minimize both our emissions and a broader environmental plan. We believe this is at the core of our social license, Mr. Parker said. <laughs> social license. Wait, what are what are social license? What the hell is that? <laughs> Virgin Australia said it regularly reviewed operational issues to ensure the airline appropriately responded to weather-related disruptions. Weather-related, I understand. Climate change-related, not so much. Uh, Qantas announced earlier this month that it aims to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050 as part of its commitment to a more sustainable aviation industry net zero emissions from an airline as yet and maybe you've seen stuff I haven't seen but as yet I have not seen an electric airliner electric jet <laughs> I don't know how they're going to get net zero emissions on their passenger jets but that's what they're saying of course they did give themselves 30 years to do so concerns about emissions and climate change are real no they're not <laughs> 
<laughs> no, they're really not. But we can't lose sight of the contribution that air travel makes to society and the economy, Qantas chief executive Alan Joyce said. The industry has already come a long way well, in cutting its footprint, and the solu solution from here isn't to simply fly less, but it's to make it more sustainable. Yeah. Climate change, responsible for your flight delays. You can take it from these guys there at Qantas. They would never lie. <laughs> oh, God. Now, I don't know how, what kind of job you have, if you have a job, but I'm thinking that if you had this job, that the person that, 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 that reported about this had, not the actual guy that wrote the blog here on Newser.com, but uh, the, the person involved in the story, if you had his job, you would think, hey, my old job at the, sitting at the desk and doing data processing or whatever wasn't quite so bad. But maybe you like animals. Maybe you love animals. Maybe you this is your ideal job. I don't know. Newser, Newser.com on uh, February 2nd. Wild herpes-infected monkeys have arrived. <laughs> so, upon reading the headline, upon reading the headline, my, my thought was, who is catching and testing these monkeys for herpes? <laughs> and and more than that, why are they testing the monkeys for herpes? <laughs> All right. Rhesus macaque monkeys have arrived in northeast Florida. A species of herpes-infected wild monkeys are roaming around parts of northern Florida for the first time, at least as far as you know. Uh, First Coast News reports, authorities were warning, uh, are warning residents of the First Coast, a northeast region along the Atlantic, as grainy eyewitness pictures and videos of recent macaque monkeys are getting around. The potential ramifications are really dire, says University of Florida primate, uh, primate scientist Steve Johnson, a big male like the one uh, in that video in Jacksonville, that's an extremely strong, potentially dangerous animal. A Florida Fish and Wildlife official concurs, saying the monkeys pose a risk uh, without management action. But no one's tried to curb the monkeys population since 2012. A tour boat operator first brought rhesus macaques to the region in the late 1930s leaving them on an island at Silver Springs, uh, Silver Springs State Park as a tourist attraction. Guess what, says Johnson? They can swim. Indeed, they've roamed to Tampa and Apapaca, uh, but, but are now making their de debut around Jacksonville. While attacks are rare, Newsweek reports on 18 known incidents of the rhesus macaques scratching or biting Floridians. In all, in all, in all, the FWC says 50 people have gotten herpes from macaques, and they're telling you they were bitten or scratched, but you don't really want to know what those Floridians were doing to those monkeys. Uh, uh, 21 cases were fatal, but none were caused by the wild variety. Okay. For now, the gray and brown monkeys with hairless pink faces seem a more, a more of a curiosity for First Coast residents. One had sharp claws and stuff, said an 80-year-old. My sister named him George, as in Curious George. <laughs> All right, Florida weirdos. Don't go out there trying to have sex with the monkeys. These monkeys have herpes. And it's and it's it's her monkey herpes. Do you want monkey herpes? <laughs> stay stay away from the monkeys. Not to mention that if they really wanted to, they could just rip your face off. 
uh, yeah, they, they can they can <laughs> they can certainly rip your face right off of your skull. Uh, so stay away from the monkeys and don't try and ask her out, ask the monkey girl out on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind of oh sock puppet. <laughs> ah, water, water, water. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, <laughs> from thehill. dot com, posted January thirty first, and I know you'll all be so so happy about this. EPA reapproves key Roundup chemical. Yes, EPA says, we know it kills people, but we're not going to let you know that, or we're not going to let you know that we know that. And we're going to go ahead and do what our masters are telling us to do and reapprove this dangerous, cancer causing chemical. The Environmental Protection Agency, <laughs> Protection Agency, has reapproved a chemical used in Bears Roundup weed killer despite concerns over its health risks. The agency is doubling down on its claims that the chemical glyphosate does not pose a danger to humans. <laughs> the agency claims the chemical glyphosate does not pose a danger to humans, despite thousands of lawsuits that attribute cancer to Roundup. The EPA found there was insufficient evidence to conclude that glyphosate plays a role in any human disease, said an agency interim registration review decision. The agency did not or did find that glyphosate presented low or limited potential risks in birds and mammals. Aren't, aren't humans mammals? At the last time I checked, humans were mammals. And what, from what I've seen, glyphosate is much more than a low or limited risk. Is it more than limited potential risk. No, it is a high and extreme beyond potential risk in birds and mammals. Yes, humans are mammals. The EPA's results differ from other research, such as the 2015 World Health Organization analysis, which found that glyphosate is probably carcinogenic probably carcinogenic to humans. The agency received some pushback over the renewed renewed approval. The Trump EPA's assertion that glyphosate poses no risk to human health disregards independent science findings in favor of a confidential industry research and industry profits. According to Larry and Lori Ann Bird, uh, Center for Biological Diversity's Director of Environmental Health, which she said in a statement, the administration's troubling allegiance to Bear Monsanto and the pesticide industry does not change the trove of peer-reviewed -review research by leading scientists that's found troubling links between glyphosate and cancer, Bird added. Glyphosate is the most commonly used herbicide among farmers and is the key ingredient in Bear Monsanto's Roundup weed killer. The company faces a myriad of lawsuits regarding the substance. Bear touted the EPA's determination in a statement on Friday. The EPA's latest decision on glyphosate-based herbicides adds to the long-term evaluation of leading international health authorities that these products can be used safely and that other gly and that glyphosate is not carcinogenic said in a statement from Bayer AG's board of, board of management member Liam Condon <coughs> excuse me 
The EPA results differ from some other research, such as a 2015 analysis, which says that glyphosate is probably carcinogenic to humans and looked at studies dealing with agricultural exposure and studies of laboratory animals. However, a 2016 statement from the WHO and Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN said that glyphosate is unlikely, unlikely to pose a carcinogenic risk to humans from exposure through diet. Well, excuse the hell out of me <laughs> for reading so many reports by so many people that have been poisoned by this nasty stuff, just sickened and or died from the cancer that it causes. Yep. Yes, this is truly, truly horrible stuff. And they have enough money to pay people off to keep it out there. All right. <laughs> this article, <laughs> I, I, I never really got past the headline when reading it because I just, I can't read while I'm laughing that hard. But I shouldn't probably be laughing. Because these guys, these guys are probably serious in what they're saying. They probably really, really mean it. But I read this. <laughs> well, here, here it is for you. G GOP lawmaker claims Constitution allows for the jailing and shooting of socialists. Enemies of the free state. So I assume this GOP lawmaker believes, first off, that what he makes are laws when they're not. They're not laws. They're, they're codes. They're not laws. And then he believes in the, the, that the Constitution is still in, in force. It's not. The Constitution has been trampled underfoot and, and used to wipe butts. It's 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 nothing. It doesn't. They they pay no attention to the Constitution. Every now and then they'll drag something up because uh, it it benefits them in some way. But if if they can ignore it, they do and will. And just uh, every every part of the Constitution has been trashed. And then the jailing and shooting of socialists. Now, I've read through that, that Constitution document hundreds of times. I've, I've been, went back and referenced various points, but I've read the entire thing hundreds of times. And nowhere in there does it mention socialists. Nowhere in there does it mention shooting people. <laughs> and then he calls them enemies of the free state. So he thinks that the United States is in some way or manner a free state. A free state? Who are you kidding? <laughs> the article. <laughs> oh, it's on stationgossip.com. By the way, stationgossip.com posted, uh, I don't think the date's up here, sometime in February. <laughs> All right. A Rep Republican lawmaker in Montana claimed Saturday that the Constitution allows for the shooting and imprisonment of socialists. You hearing me, Anti? You paying attention, Anti? <laughs> How about you, Robes? <laughs> uh, State Rep Rodney Garcia. Uh, first made the remark on Friday following a speech by former Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. According to the Billings Gazette, Garcia told Zinke he is worried that socialists are entering our government. Well, Garcia, the, the government is socialist. All governments are socialist. Governments are socialist by nature. That's how they work. The only way that a government can be there is to promise people things or services. 
And one of the services, I guess, that most people would be okay with is the defense of the nation against foreign invaders. But that's a socialist program. It's a socialist program. Because how do they do it? They take your money, they take it by force, and then they use it to fund this, this thing that they say is a benefit to everyone. Therefore, it benefits society. Therefore, it's a social program. Therefore, it's socialist. <laughs> so you, being a representative, a state representative, though, not, you know, not a federal, but a state representative, are part of this socialist government. So if they, if the Constitution allows for the imprisonment or murder of socialists, you're one of them. <laughs> anyway, he suggested that the Constitution permits jailing or shooting. Zinke did not engage Garcia, the Gazette reported. However, when Garcia was questioned about the comments on Saturday, he doubled down and called socialists enemies to the free state. Free state being a huge oxymoron. You can't have free and state. Free state. No, it doesn't work. The state is the monopoly on violence within the specified area that they claim to control. Free is not entered into the thing there. When you're part of the state, the state can tell you what to do, and you have to do it, or they will visit that violence upon you. <laughs> Free state. And said their ideology is very dangerous. So actually, in the Constitution of the United States, if they are found guilty of being a socialist member, <laughs> is that a socialist dick? Socialist member, you either go to prison or are shot, he said. They're enemies of the free state, Garcia added. What, what, what do we do with our enemies in war, in Vietnam, Afghanistan, all those? What did we do? In response to his comments, the Montana Republican Party condemned Garcia. The Montana Republican Party wholeheartedly condemns the comment that was made under no, uh, the co and the comment that was made under no circumstances is violence against someone with opposing political views acceptable. Yeah. It seems pretty acceptable to y'all. I mean, you go out and start wars all around, all around the world because those people have opposing political views to yours. It's disappointing that the, this isolated incident took away from the weekend's event, which showcased the strength of our statewide candidates and the importance of the upcoming election. Oh, yes, the most important election in your lifetime, as they always are. Spencer Merwin, executive director of the Montana GOP, said the Gazette, uh, said the Gazette reported. Uh, it, it's just the whole thing. It's just such twisted thinking, twisted logic. Uh, I, I don't know if these people really believe the words that are coming out of their mouth. If they understand what they're saying groups them in with the people they're saying are terrible, horrible people. If they really think that there's something as known as a free state. <laughs> I, I don't really get it. I don't quite understand these folks, but uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. So this is old, and, and you probably know it by now. Uh, this is on March or uh, February 4th um, on ZeroHedge.com via GreatGameIndia.com. And even though it's not admitted out there by the by the the clap, the corporate lay mass propaganda. They don't. They 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 say nothing about this at all. And if they do say something about it, it comes in a a laughing tone. Oh, what crazy conspiracy theories? Yeah. The creator of the United States Bioweapons Act says 
coronavirus is a biological warfare weapon. No doubt. In an explosive interview, Dr. Francis Boyle, who drafted the Biological Weapons Act, has given a detailed statement admitting that the 2019 Wuhan coronavirus is an offensive biological warfare weapon and that the World Health Organization already knows about it. Francis Boyle is a professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law. He drafted the United States domestic implementation, implementing uh, legislation for the Biological Weapons Convention, known as the Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989. That was approved unanimously by both houses of the U.S. Congress and signed into law by then-President G.H.W. Bush. In an exclusive interview with the Geopolitics and Empire, Dr. Boyle discusses the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, China, or Wuhan, China, and the Biosafety Level 4 Laboratory, BSL-4, from which he believes the infection disease escaped or was released. He believes the virus is potentially lethal, yes, yeah, proven lethal, and an offensive biological warfare weapon or dual-use biowarfare weapons agent genetically modified with gain-of-function properties, which is why the Chinese government originally tried to cover it up and is now taking drastic measures to contain it. Unsuccessfully, I may add. The Woohoo Han BSL-4 lab is also a specially designed World Health Organization research lab, and Dr. Boyle contends the WHO knows full well what is occurring, which is probably why they have not declared a global pandemic as a yet. <laughs> Dr. Boyle also touches upon Great Gamaldi's exclusive uh, report, Coronavirus Bioweapon, bio where we reported in detail how Chinese biowarfare agents working at the Canadian lab in Winnipeg were involved in the smuggling of coronavirus to the Wuhan lab, uh, where it's believed to have been leaked. There's a, a video interview here that uh, you may want to uh, check out that. Um, Dr. Boyle's position is in stark contrast, stark contrast to the main, to the collapse uh, narrative of the virus being originated from a seafood market, which is increasingly being questioned by many experts. Recently, American Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas also dismantled the mainstream media's claim on Thursday that pinned the coronavirus outbreak on a market to selling dead and live animals. The video accompanying his post, Cotton explained that the Wuhan wet market, uh, which Cotton incorrectly referred to as the seafood market, has been shown by experts to not be the source of the deadly contagion. Not be the source of the deadly contagion. Cotton referenced the Lancet study, which showed that many of the first cases of the novel coronavirus include patient zero. Do I didn't even know they had identified a patient zero yet. Anyway, so including patient zero had no connection to the wet market, devastatingly undermining mainstream media's claim that CLAP fails again. As one epidemiologist said, the virus went into the seafood market before it came out of the seafood market. We still don't know where it originated, Cotton said. And I would note that Wuhan also uh, has China's only biosafety level 4 super laboratory that works with the world's most deadly pathogens to include, yes, coronavirus. Coronavirus. All right, the article goes on for a bit, and you can read the rest, but I think you get the concept the idea, there's videos also 
involved here that you may want to watch. Have you not seen them yet? As I said, it's almost a month old, this article. And uh, there you go. There you go. Woohoo! Han! <laughs> All right, let's quickly head back to Florida. Yes, we're going back to Florida. WGNTV.com. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Florida Florida troopers find narcotics in a bag labeled bag full of drugs. This is on uh, February 4th, 2020 on WGNTV.com. Yeah. <laughs> bag full of drugs. <laughs> Santa Rosa County, Florida. The Florida Highway Patrol arrested two men suspected of drug trafficking after troopers pulled them over and found drugs in a bag labeled bag full of drugs. The men were pulled over Saturday for speeding on I-10 in the Florida Panhandle. Uh, the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office assisted in the vehicle search, which turned up methamphetamine, GHP, also known as the uh, date rape drug, cocaine, MDMA, and fentanyl. Note to self. Do not traffic your illegal narcotics in bags labeled bag full of drugs. <laughs> Our canines can read, the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office posted Monday night on social media. <laughs> Woo, bag full of drugs. <laughs> Stupid. Oh, I should have included that other story, uh, the crime pays tattoo on the forehead of the idiot. I, but I already talked about that, I think, last week. Uh, anyway, <laughs> bag full of drugs, come on down. <laughs> You're the next contestant on Who's the Idiot Today? Oh, man. <laughs> All right, from uh, Futurism, Futurism.com, February 4th, 2020. Are you knitting? Are you a knitter? Maybe a crocheter? Maybe macrame? I don't know. What, what all kinds of different stuff uses yarn? So if you're one of these people, maybe you want to try this stuff out. But I'm thinking probably not. <laughs> This horrific yarn is made from human flesh. That's right. Made from human flesh. We can sew pouches, create tubes, valves, and perforated membranes. A team of researchers at the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research in Bordeaux have grown yarn from human skin cells that they call a human textile. And they say it could be used by surgeons to close wounds or assemble implantable skin grafts. These human textiles offer a unique level of biocompatibility and represent a new generation of completely biological tissue-engineered products, the researchers wrote in a paper published by the journal Acta Biomateriala. Uh, the key advantage of the gruesome yarn is that unlike, unlike conventional synthetical surgical materials, the material does not trigger an immune response that can complicate the healing process, according to new scientists. To create it, according to the magazine, the researchers cut sheets of human skin cells into long strips and then wove them into yarn-like material that can be fabricated into a variety of shapes. We can sew pouches, create tubes, valves, and perforated membranes, lead researcher Nicolas Lahou, some French name, told New Scientist. With the yarn, any textile approach is feasible. Knitting, braiding, weaving, even crocheting. <laughs> so far, the researchers have used the special yarn to stitch a rat's wounds and help it fully heal over two weeks. 
They can even create a skin graft using a custom-made loom to seal a sheep's artery and stop it from leaking. Uh, the, the work builds on prior research by the same team in which they produced sheets of bio, bio material and rolled them into artificial blood vessels. So it doesn't say anything really here about socks or sweaters or scarves or things like that. But I assume if you want a human skin yarn <laughs> pair of socks, it's probably going to cost you a few dollars. They're probably not cheap. You know, I, I, would, I would imagine they're not cheap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right, that's my last story for tonight. Episode 61, coming to an end. Let me just say thank you all for tuning in. It's been a good time. Tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern is Flash Somebody and probably a, a, a co-hostage, maybe two, on his program, In a Perfect World. So check him out. Uh, Wednesday morning at, well, noon Eastern, Wednesday at noon Eastern, is Lonnie Clark's second to last show, The Age of Fission. I don't have the uh, data on it yet, so I don't know exactly what it's going to be about, but Tune in there uh, here on RLM Radio Wednesday morning uh, for the second to last show of Asia Fission. It's been going on for since Fukushima, and then on uh, Thursday nothing. Thursday's nothing. Yeah, uh, Friday is uh, the Freakers Ball. Myself and the Moose Girl. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody. I appreciate y'all being here with me uh, during this program. And hopefully you'll be around for the rest of the shows. And uh, appreciate it. That's it. Have a great night and a great week. Peace.